This is Larry Moore. I'd like to welcome you back to our biological wastewater treatment training series. Uh, today we'll be uh, doing presentation number four. And we're going to be talking about activated sludge biokinetics, an introduction to activated sludge biokinetics. So last time we, we or the third presentation, we talked about microbiology. So today we're going to mathematically describe what the bacteria do in the activated sludge process. It's really uh, rather interesting. But when we design, as environmental engineers, when we design activated sludge processes, normally we do it using biokinetic relationships. Now we can design activated sludge using uh, unit loading concepts, but by and large, engineers like to design activated sludge using the biokinetic relationships. Most of these relationships have been around for 60 or 70 years, so we have a lot of confidence in them and they allow us to do a good job of designing the process. And then once we have the process designed, it's constructed and it's operating, we can use these relationships as I do in my BioTiger model to actually evaluate the process. So not only is useful in design, but it's also useful in evaluating the performance and adjusting the performance of the activated sludge process. So here again is our basic activated sludge uh, process, the uh, biological reactor on the left and the secondary clarifier on the right. Uh, as you can see, I have a lot of parameters shown here. Uh, many of these I'll have listed in subsequent slides. We won't spend a lot of time on them, but each of these, is each of these parameters is important in mathematically describing what happens in the activated sludge process solids production, oxygen requirements, and other uh, facets of the process. So all of these parameters are important. Uh, one thing I will point out is that when you see capital Q, that's a flow rate, usually in million gallons per day. S is the growth limiting substrate concentration, um, a capital S, and X is biomass concentration. So when you look at, uh, Q, S sub O, and X sub O going into the biologic reactor. That's our influent loading. Q is the influent flow rate in million gallons per day. S sub O is the, basically the uh, influent biodegradable CBOD5 CBOD concentration. And X sub O will be the influent biomass concentration. And normally X sub O is negligible because it's small compared to the mass of biomass that we have in the biological reactor. Another picture of the biological reactor, uh, an aerobic reactor. This one again, fairly long and narrow. So this is uh, similar to a plug flow reactor, uh, a very efficient type of uh, reactor. And, uh, and again, you see the aeration providing uh, intimate contact of the biomass with the incoming wastewater and also uh, providing oxygen for the biomass to oxidize the organic matter. We'll spend a little bit of time on this slide because the growth and energy equation that we have here, I've shown it to you once or twice in the previous presentations. Please remember this equation is the essence of the activated sludge process. It's the essence of life in living organ in most living organisms. It's what keeps you and me alive and keeps us uh, functioning every day. But it's the growth and energy equation, or we could also call it the synthesis and oxidation equation. But organic matter that comes into the process is going to be degraded by the microorganism, primarily the bacteria, because again, as I mentioned in the previous presentation, the bacteria are about 95% of our biomass in the activated sludge process. So they are our primary workhorses. They are going to oxidize the organic matter to CO2 and water to generate energy. That's the energy reaction. And then the synthesis or growth reaction is organics plus nitrogen plus phosphorus produces new cells. So this reaction shows you the two ways that organic matter can be channeled in the activated sludge processes. These are going to be channeled into the synthesis reaction and grow biomass, 
or it's going to be channeled into the oxidation reaction or energy reaction, and it's going to allow the bacteria to generate energy. So again, this is the essence of the activated sludge process. Again, this reaction is going on in my body and your body right now to keep us alive. We're using organic matter. Oxygen is the electron acceptor, and uh, we oxidize the organic matter to generate energy. And then we're also using organic matter plus nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus to grow new cells to replace uh, the cells in our body that are dying. So it's extremely important biochemical relationship here. These are some of the parameters I mentioned earlier. Again, Q is flow rate, S is substrate concentration, X is biomass concentration. Um, and so I won't spend a lot of time on these, but as we present these in equations in subsequent slides, you can go back to this and the next two slides to see what the definition of some of these parameters are, because again, you may not be used used to them at all, and maybe new to you. So again, X is biomass, S is substrate. And again, what we, what we assume in our biokinetic relationship, we assume that the influent biodegradable organic matter, the influent carbonaceous BOD5 is mostly in soluble form. Now in actual practice, about 20 to 50% of the incoming biodegradable organic matter will be in solution. Uh, 50 to 80% of it will be in particulate form. So generally what I do, instead of using soy S, uh, S sub O, uh, which is the influence substrate concentration, uh, I generally will use, instead of the soluble portion, I'll generally use the total BOD5 of the influent. And the reason I do that is because the particulate organic matter, as I mentioned the other day uh, in the third presentation, the, uh, the particulate organic matter will be broken down by the exocellular enzymes and uh, through hydrolysis, and that particular organic matter will ultimately be used as food. And that occurs uh, relatively quickly in the activated sludge process. And we have some biokinetic constants, uh, K sub S, uh, mu max, those are biokinetic constants. Um, mu is specific growth rate of the biomass. And again, it's a very important uh, uh, biological process growth rate. And then we also have specific substrate utilization rate, which is uh, the rate that the uh, biomass are actually using the carbonaceous BOD for food. So again, these, this slide and the two previous slides, again, provide you some definitions that you can refer back to. As I mentioned in the discussion about the biomass, sludge age is extremely important in activated sludge. It controls the process. Um, so when we design an activated sludge process, sludge age is a key design parameter. When you're operating activated sludge process, sludge age is a key operating parameter. And again, in my mathematical equations, I usually use the uh, parameter theta sub C uh, to represent sludge age. We said the other day, it's also called MCRT, mean cell resonance time, or solids retention time, SRT. But it's like saying soft drink, soda pop, Coke, Pepsi. Basically, we're saying the same thing is how long the biomass stays in the activated sludge system until they exit in the waste sludge, that's intentional wastage, or they exit as suspended solids in the effluent, we call that unintentional wastage. But again, a very important design and operating parameter. And, and when an operator operates an activated sludge process, he has basically four parameters that he can choose from uh, to control the process. One is mixed liquor suspended solids concentration, two is sludge age, three is food to microorganism ratio, and four is solids inventory. Most operators choose the first one, mixed liquor suspended solids concentration, and they'll just manipulate the process to keep the mixed liquor suspended solids in a range where they get good performance and good effluent quality, good sludge sellability, and the process works well. Uh, so that's what most operators use, and that's fine. Some operators will calculate sludge age, many of them don't. Uh, 
most operators probably don't calculate F over M ratio. And then I said the fourth operating parameter is solids inventory. But what I want you to understand is if you're an operator, choose ever which one of those four that you're most comfortable with to operate your plant and, and, and then use it. Use the one that you're most comfortable with. But what I want you to understand is once you choose one of those operating parameters and you operate at a certain value for that parameter, you automatically set the other three values, whether or not you calculate them. So we need to keep that in mind. And again, we set those parameter values by uh, controlling the, the activated sludge, the biomass in the process. Again, um, sludge age is very important. Theta sub C, you can see at the bottom of the diagram there, uh, theta sub C is, is equal to our solids inventory, which when we develop the activated sludge process, we assume that almost all of our solids inventory is in the biological reactor. We, we assume that there's negligible accumulation of biomass in the secondary clarifier. Uh, so if we ignore the biomass in the secondary clarifier, normally biomass and secondary clarifier will be 10, 15, maybe 20% of the total biomass in the system in most cases. But theta C is equal to our biomass inventory divided by the denominator is the biomass leaving the system each day. Q sub W, that's our waste sludge flow rate times the solids concentration in the waste sludge. That's our intentional wasting. That's the solids that go out intentionally in the waste sludge. Q minus Q sub W, X sub B, that's the solids going out in the effluent. That's what we call our unintentional wastage. So the sludge age, our solids inventory divided by the solids wasted intentionally plus the solids wasted unintentionally. And again, very important design and operating parameter. Another important uh, relationship is uh, the relationship between the specific growth rate of the biomass and the sludge age or theta sub C. And according to this equation, you can see that the specific growth rate of the biomass is inversely proportional to the sludge age. So as we increase sludge age, we will reduce the specific growth rate of the biomass. We need to keep that in mind. These are the biokinetic constants or the biokinetic coefficients that are most important to us as we design the activated sludge process. Mu max, K sub S, K sub E, Y, little k, um, these are very, very important. Uh, mu max, uh, that, will be adjusted for temperature. K sub S, we don't adjust that for temperature. K sub B, which is also K sub D, the endogenous decay coefficient, um, we'll adjust that for temperature. As temperature increases, the endogenous decay co uh, coefficient will increase. Why is the biomass yield? That's the biomass produced per unit substrate consumed. So it's an important parameter. And why is the theoretical yield? And in little k, the maximum specific substrate utilization rate, again, that's influenced by temperature. As temperature in the mixed liquor increases, uh, the value of k increases. So in, in the calculations, in the BioTiger model that I've developed, mu max, k sub e, and little k will be adjusted by the temperature that you specify for the process. This relationship, which allows us to calculate the soluble carbonaceous BOD5 of the effluent, which is very important. Uh, we developed this relationship. I, we don't have time to go through the derivation, but what we do as we derive these relationships, normally we'll do mass balances of either biomass or substrate around the biological reactor, or we'll do mass balances of biomass or substrate around the entire activated sludge process to allow us to uh, develop these design relationships. But the important thing I want you to recognize here is on the right-hand side of the equation, everything on the right-hand side of the equation except theta sub C, and we, yeah, and we recognize that as sludge age. It's another name for sludge age. But every component on the right-hand side of the equation except theta sub C is a biokinetic constant. 
Now we have theta sub c in the numerator, but in the numerator it's multiplied by case b. The typical value of case b is 0.1. So 0.1 times theta sub c is a very small value. So it has a minor impact on the calculation of, of s sub b. But the key value of theta sub c is here, it's in the denominator. So what we can say is that the soluble CBOD5 concentration of the effluent is inversely proportional to theta sub C. So as we increase theta sub C, the soluble CBOD5 concentration of the effluent will decrease. That's a good thing. So we should get our best effluent quality at longer sludge ages. And this, this relationship has been derived based on monode kinetics. Monode in about 1950 made the assumption that the specific growth rate of the biomass or the and the specific substrate utilization rate, they can be mathematically described in the same way that an enzyme catalyzed reaction can be described. And so we still base our biokinetic design on what Mono did 70 years ago. So if we plot S sub B versus theta sub C, or in this case, uh, I've changed it to SRT. Again, theta sub C is equal to SRT, is equal to MCRT, is equal to sludge age. So as we increase our SRT, you can see that uh, the soluble CBOD5 concentration uh, declines rather dramatically. And even though this is a semi-empirical, excuse me, a semi-theoretical relationship, what I found, I've evaluated somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 activated sludge processes in the United States in the last 10 to 15 years. And what I found is this relationship that you see here, it, it does a really bang up job in calculating or determining the soluble CBOD5 concentration in the effluent. I have a lot of confidence in it. So if you're an activated sludge process, maybe you're an oxidation dish, you're operating at about a 20-day SRT, then the soluble CBOD5 concentration of your effluent is probably going to be somewhere around 2 milligrams per liter. I have a lot of confidence in this relationship. But what that does, it allows us to calculate the total CBOD5 of the effluent. What I'm gonna introduce now is a seven step process whereby an engineer can design the activated sludge process. There are many ways to design the activated sludge process. This is just one way that we might do it, okay? Uh, step one would be determine our effluent requirement. Our NPDES permit will specify the total CBOD5 or total BOD5 concentration that we have to meet it, uh, in our permit. All right, so if the permit says CBOD5 of the effluent, that's total CBOD5. So what we'll do, we can use the previous relationship to calculate or determine S sub B, the soluble CBOD5. And then we can add two S sub B, F times X sub B represents the particulate or suspended CBOD5 of the effluent. So what we do, we take this value F which is grams of CBOD5 per grams of suspended solids in the effluent. And that value would normally be 0.3 to 0.6. And we'll multiply that value F times the suspended solids of the effluent. And we'll approximate what the particulate CBOD5 of the effluent is. We add that to S sub B, and that will give us approximation of what the total CBOD, CBOD5 of the effluent is. And again, I use this relationship a lot. And as I evaluate activated sludge processes, it does a really good job of estimating the total CBOD5 of the effluent. This uh, slide gives you some of the, the values for our important biokinetic constants. And the values that you see here for the typical values for mu max, k sub s, k sub b, y, little k. These are the typical values that I use when I design and evaluate the activated sludge process. The only thing I might change a little bit is oftentimes I'll use 0.1 for K sub B instead of 0.08. That'll make a little bit of a difference. But these values, again, we have uh, 60 or 70 years of data, research data and uh, actual activated sludge operating data. 
to, to again verify that these values are very accurate if you're treating municipal wastewater um, in the United States and even in, in wastewater in other countries I've used this relationship uh, we'll just have to adjust the loadings a little bit when we look at activated sludge when I'm looking at wastewater from other countries. Uh, step three in the design process again we can assume the value of the mixed liquor volatile suspended solids concentration and I give you a range for conventional activated sludge and a range for extended uh, aeration activated sludge. So assume an MLBSS value and then in step four we use the equation here to calculate the volume of the reactor but basically this equation uh, shows the relationship between volume of reactor X sub V which is the mixed liquor volatile suspended solids concentration and theta sub C or sludge age. So when we design the, the activated sludge process we'll use this equation to determine the volume of the reactor. Once the plan is built the volume of the reactor is fixed. So then what we'll do we'll use this equation and we can, uh, what we'll see is theta sub C then with V fixed and the other parameters, biokinetic constants, influent loading, the effluent soluble BOD5 concentration will be determined by theta sub C. Theta sub C will determine what the biomass concentration in the reactor is. So uh, very important design and operating relationship. But if we use that equation and we calculate MLSS versus SRT, and what I've done, and I said, okay, let's assume we've got a, uh, an extended aeration activated sludge process. It's designed and operating at 1 million gallons a day. We're treating medium strength municipal wastewater. that has a BOD5 concentration of 200 milligrams per liter and an influence suspended solids concentration of about 200 milligrams per liter. This gives us an estimate for, again, that one MGD process of about what our biomass concentration is depending upon SRT. SRT, as said by the previous equation, will dictate the biomass concentration. So if we're in the range of 20 to 40 days for extended aeration activated sludge, then our biomass, our mixed liquor spin and solids concentration will be somewhere in the range of 2,000 to 4,000 milligrams per liter typically. Step five, we want to determine the volatile solids production or the volatile solids uh, that will waste from the system each day. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, these relationships are based on assuming a steady state uh, analysis. Uh, so we get the activated sludge process up and running and, and it's achieved a quasi steady state. Then and when everything's working well, well then we want to keep it operating at, at that level because we, we found that that works well for us. So ever how if we're operating at steady state conditions, ever how much biomass we produce each day, that's how much we want to waste from the system each day to keep our operating parameters where they are, where we're getting good results. The biomass production, uh, volatile solid production, PXVSS, is equal to this first term, which we call A, which is our heterotrophic biomass production, plus B, the second term, this is our cell debris. Uh, Wes Eckenfelder, he always called it bug bones. It's what's left over after the biomass have been uh, completely oxidized. So it's the cell debris or bug bones. So that's part of the biomass production. And then this last term, Q times X sub O I, that is the inert, volatile suspended solids that are coming in in the influent. If they're inert, they're not going to be biodegradable. So they will accumulate and end up as solids in our waste sludge as part of the, so those three components, A, heterotrophic biomass, B, cell debris, and the inert VSS in the influent, that is our VSS production. But in activated sludge and, and in operating practice, we want to calculate our total suspended solids production. So PXTS is, is exactly that, the total suspended solids production in our process. So we take our heterotrophic biomass, we divide by 0.85 because we make the assumption that biomass is 85% volatile solids. 
the cell debris, we divide by 0.85, we assume it is 85% volatile solids. Then C is our inert VSS production. And then the fourth component in this equation, that is the amount of inert inorganic solids that are coming in the raw wastewater that will contribute to our uh, total solid production in the activated sludge process. And again, that's our daily solids production and that corresponds to the amount that we wanna waste from the system to keep the system where, where it is in its steady state uh, working well. And the analogy is the human body. I hate to say it, but I weigh 235 pounds. I may eat five pounds of food and liquid today, so tomorrow will I weigh 240 pounds? No, I won't. I'll probably still weigh 235 because I'm at, at a quasi steady state. So what happens to those five pounds of food I take in today? Well, some's oxidized CO2 and water. Some comes out the rear end as waste solids. Some come out the front end as waste liquid. And so when I do, I'm in that steady state. So even though I, I may take in five pounds of food today, I'm still going to weigh about 235 pounds tomorrow. So that shows you again and gives you a feel for a steady state analysis. Our solids production, again, what you see here, and this is important, as you increase SRT, the solids production decreases. So going back to our biochemical equation for synthesis and energy, again, the BOD is channeled into those two components. As we increase sludge age, we're going to channel less of the BOD into the synthesis reaction and more into the oxygen or energy reaction. So as we increase SRT, SRT our biomass production goes down. Next step, step seven, we will actually determine our oxygen requirements. That helps us uh, design our aeration system. So the supply of the amount of oxygen that we need in the activated sludge process. So the oxygen required, there's three components of it. The, the first two components represent the ultimate CBOD of the wastewater that is being, um, that consumes oxygen. So let's look at those first two components. This first term, 8.34 Q times S of O minus S of B divided by 0.67, that is the total carbonaceous, total ultimate carbonaceous BOD that's removed in the process. But as I said, that BOD load goes into synthesis reactions, which doesn't generate, doesn't consume oxygen. And the rest of it goes into the uh, energy reaction that does consume oxygen. So we take the total, excuse me, the total ultimate CBOD removed and then we subtract out the oxygen equivalent of the in, incoming BOD that goes into biomass production. So these first two components calculate the total amount of oxygen that's gonna be used in the ener energy reaction. Uh, and that is what consumes oxygen. And then the third component is the oxygen required to oxidize the uh, ammonia nitrogen to nitrate nitrogen. And theoretically that consumes 4.57 pounds of oxygen per pound of ammonia oxidized to nitrate. Well, then you might ask, well, why do we use 4.33? The reason we use 4.33 is because not all of the ammonia will get oxidized to nitrate. About 5% of the ammonia will be used in, in producing nitrifier biomass. So when we subtract that 5% out, then we reduce the theoretical amount 4.57 down to 4.33. And that's a more accurate calculation of the oxygen we need for nitrification. Now, if we plot the fraction of, uh, of the incoming nitrogen that is oxidizable in, in the process, if we plot that versus SRT, what you see is the relationship here. If we operate at about a two or three day SRT, 
we're going to have hardly any nitrifiers in our system because they're slow growers and we're wasting them out of the system faster than they can reproduce and sustain themselves. So the nitrification rate is very low. So our fraction nitri um, of the nit uh, oxidizable nitrogen oxidized is very low. But as we begin to increase the SRT up to three, five, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 days, you can see that nitrification becomes much more pronounced. And I use this, uh, this is a, an empirically derived relationship. I've evaluated, uh, and in the literature, we've evaluated uh, numerous activated sludge plants to come up with this relationship, which helps us uh, estimate how much, what fraction of the uh, oxidizable nitrogen is actually oxidized in the activated sludge process. This shows you the plot of the total oxygen used in the activated sludge process uh, based on SRT. So again, SRT determines uh, biomass production. It determines the amount of oxygen required in the process. As I said earlier, the incoming BOD load is channeled into the energy reaction, is channeled into the synthesis reaction. As we increase SRT, more of the BOD will go into the energy reaction and so we will increase our oxygen requirements as we increase SRT. So, so for this one MGD extended aeration activated sludge process, operating typically in a 20 to 40 day SRT and assuming medium strength municipal wastewater, then we would expect to need about 3000 pounds of oxygen for that uh, process. So that wraps up our presentation today using our biokinetic relationships. I know I uh, uh, laid a lot on you in a fairly short amount of time. You'll need to go back and look at these slides that are provided for you. And uh, again, they help us not only design the activated sludge process, but then once it's actually up and operating, the, these equations allow us to evaluate the process um, help us improve the performance of the process, improve effluent quality, uh, minimize our oxygen requirements if we're trying to save energy. Uh, and again, extremely useful and do a good job of estimating, uh, again, what happens biologically in the process. So thank you for listening today. Uh, have a great day. If you need to contact me, have questions or comments, you can contact me at the address, uh, email address there or you can contact Tom Winning if you have comments about um, this presentation. So have a great day. Thank you.